Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Global CCS Institute's EU Industry Week event, organized in partnership with the European Commission. My name is Galoran Turang, and I'm the General Manager of Advocacy and Communications at the Global CCS Institute. And today we will be discussing CCS and reaching net zero targets in Europe. We have an outstanding line of speakers who will be joining, including representatives from um, European Commission's Director General for Climate Action, along with industry experts from Heidelberg Cement, Acre Carbon Capture, and EBN, who I will be introducing to you very shortly. For those of you who are perhaps not very familiar with the Global CCS Institute, we're an international think tank supported by governments, uh, industry, and NGOs. And our mission is to accelerate the deployment of CCS as a vital technology to tackle climate change. We are located in, we have got offices in six countries, uh, including an office in Brussels and in London. Of course, we're all operating virtually at the moment. If you're on Twitter, follow us at Global CCS, and please be sure to chime in or follow us as we live tweet using the hashtag EU industry CCS. Before we dive in, I'd encourage you to ask your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function, which is, as you know, uh, in, in Zoom, it's down at, at the bottom. And I please ask you not to use the chat function because it, for a moderator, it makes it a little difficult for me to follow um, both sets of questions. So thank you for, thank you for this um, attention. Now, I'd just like to say a few words about uh, the EU and, and carbon capture and storage. Um, the EU has been a leader in terms of developing and implementing uh, progressive climate policies, along with targets to reach climate neutrality by the middle of the century. As we all know, EU aims to reach, uh, reduce its emissions by at least 55% by 2030. Reaching these targets will not be an easy feat, and will require a comprehensive strategic approach and a united front, not only from government's member states, but also from, from industry and particularly energy intensive uh, sectors across, across Europe. Over the last decade, we've seen a promising move towards sustainable sources of energy, including the role out of, of much needed renewables like wind and solar, and this shift of obviously is bringing us closer to meeting our climate targets in, in Europe. However, to reach the climate neutrality target of, of, of by 2050, um, we need to accelerate the deployment of, of carbon capture and, and storage rapidly. In 2020, we saw CCS commitments and uh, supportive funding announcements come out of, of Europe that suggest we're on the right path. According to the Institute's flagship report, Global Status of CCS, which is available on our website and is free for you to download and I encourage you to do so, um, there are 13 commercial facilities in various stages of development across Europe, with Norway and the Netherlands playing a notable role uh, in terms of the deployment of the technology across the continent. When we look at the world globally, there are 65 commercial facilities in the pipeline in various different stages of development. And this marks a remarkable jump from 2019. Even still, that number, there are some 26 operating facilities today that will need to uh, scale up by a, hundred, uh, by a factor of 100 from some 20 odd to 2000 by the middle of the century if we are to reach uh, the Paris Agreement goal and targets under the uh, European Green Deal. To be clear, CCS technology is required if we are to reach net zero, and its application is particularly necessary in hard to abate sectors, such as cement, for instance, where process emissions cannot be adequately reduced through alternative means such as electrification, and we will discuss this more uh, with, in, with the panel in a few minutes. The EU Innovation Fund um, is a promising example of policy and funding incentives that can uh, bolster industrial decarbonization through CCS. The 10 billion euro fund, and as we say 10 billion, 
I did a quick calculation at the back of my head and some 450 million allowances with the increase in the carbon price, perhaps it's more like 17 or 18 billion at the moment. And of course, this will be something that I'll uh, discuss with um, the, our speaker from DG Klima Maria in a moment. Um, it aims to, this fund aims to spur innovation and particularly in low, growth, low carbon technologies. And we understand that there have been some 60 uh, applications with the CCUS component calling for uh, funding support. And um, in applications, uh, various applications ranging from, from clean hydrogen production to carbon dioxide removal, and of course, in industrial applications. In Norway, we saw the Longship project move ahead with uh, the Norwegian government support and financial backing. This historic hub and cluster project uh, will provide enough CO2 storage capacity that will benefit uh, regions all across Europe. Continued collaboration across um, governments and businesses backed by tangible policy development will be needed now more than ever, uh, particularly following the um, economic and, and social circumstances brought about by the, the COVID pandemic. The EU is at crossroads and coming months and years will be crucially important to, uh, be, to ensure that it's on its path to meeting the 2050 climate neutrality target. CCS will pl play a critical role in that effort. And of course, the adoption of the, the, the quicker adoption of the technology will be dependent on conditions that will uh, support its deployment be it regulatory conditions in the EU that, for example, incentivize the build out of CO2 transport and storage infrastructure, and TENI comes to mind here, or financial conditions that will call for further CCS investment. With that, I'm very pleased to invite Ms. Maria Volkova to uh, discuss, present about the, um, the EU climate action, and in particular, um, the climate fund, the innovation, sorry, fund, which I'm sure all the participants are very interested to hear about. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for this excellent introduction, uh, which actually makes uh, my job today quite uh, easier. So if you could uh, move to the next slide uh, directly. Um, in fact, um, this uh, is a graph which uh, explains the EU path to climate neutrality. First and foremost, I would like to underline that Europe is the first continent that adopted an objective for climate neutrality in 2050. And we in the European Commission are constantly reviewing and remodeling the ways to get to this climate neutrality. We know that this is for sure possible, but all sectors will need to contribute and we need to provide a lot more direction in terms of regulation and financial incentives. What you see on this graph is that uh, Europe has reduced emissions as foreseen in 2020 or towards 2020. And the path to reducing emissions will continue towards 2050. But without further measures, actually, we are unlikely to reach uh, climate neutrality. This is on one hand why we are looking to review actually all current legislation which uh, impacts greenhouse gas emissions, but also uh, with the current targets, there is a substantial risk that in certain sectors, certain installations will, uh, be, uh, will have stranded assets. And this is the reason why actually the European Commission has proposed an increased ambition, i.e. to reduce emissions in 2030 by 55% in comparison to what we had already 40%. So this is really quite a big change. And that's why actually all my colleagues are currently busy to review all the legislation, as I mentioned, the EU ETS, the effort sharing, sharing decision, UCF, renewable energy, energy efficiency, the transport uh, regulations. And this will allow uh, all sectors to contribute on one hand. And on the other hand, we hope to be giving a very clear investment uh, signal. So all future investments are aligned with the objective for climate neutrality. 
And this is why it is actually so important to talk about CCS among all the other technologies that reduce emissions. CCS, we expect, will play a very important role as uh, mentioned already by Gloren, uh, in the sectors which have difficulty to reduce emissions otherwise, but also uh, to compensate for emissions in certain sectors like agriculture and transport, where emissions will not go to zero, and therefore we need to rely on what is known as negative emissions. We prefer actually to call them net carbon removals, actually, and that's why on this graph you can see there is, uh, well, a kind of a beige here, low below the zero, which is actually the contribution of carbon removal technologies. And in within uh, this, we have, uh, of course, more detailed graphs to show that, but uh, the contribution of CCSA is quite important. So we need to, well, continue speeding up uh, the development of technologies, uh, the commercialization. And I'm very happy actually to be working for the Innovation Fund. And you can move maybe to the next slide because already Gloren presented uh, a little bit what the Innovation Fund uh, uh, is doing or we have started doing, we have not delivered anything yet. Uh, we're in the middle actually of uh, the first actually two competitions, the, the call for large scale projects and the call for small scale projects. But the Innovation Fund is a 10 year uh, program to support uh, large scale demonstrations of innovative technologies in the sectors of energy intensive industries, renewables, energy storage, and carbon capture use and storage are actually mentioned specifically, although in practice, they are actually quite often linked to energy intensive industries or power generation, which is also covered by the EU ETS. So if you could move, move to the next slide, um, I would like to explain in very brief terms, uh, the results actually of the first, uh, co-applications, which uh, the first call for large scale projects, uh, the first stage of it actually closed at the end of October. We are about to finalize uh, the evaluation of this first stage. And by the end of March, we will be sending letters to the applicants. And we received more than 300 applications. And uh, we are very happy with the results, uh, a bit overwhelmed, I must say, because uh, we actually quite oversubscribed. Uh, the, all these uh, applications are requesting more than 21 billion euro, whereas uh, the Innovation Fund first call, actually we have set aside 1 billion. So the competition is really, really high. 70 of these applications will be invited to second stage. But what is uh, really good, actually, is that uh, we have received applications from all sectors and from all member states. So there is interest, very big interest in the fund. And when we talk about CCS, indeed, uh, I, in the next slide I will show, but maybe still on this slide to show that in the specific sector, which is called CCS, there were 14 applications. But when we analyzed further the applications, we actually indeed discovered, and if you could move to the next slide, that in fact, 21% uh, of the applications, or around 60 applications, have a component of carbon capture, utilization, or storage, or combination of, of these different elements. And in the Innovation Fund, what is really good is that uh, applicants can focus only on one element, but of course, they have to ensure that if, for example, they're capturing the, the CO2, it has to go either for utilization or for storage, not, not just capturing and testing a capture facility. This is perhaps a bit of a particularity. And then what was um, really, really good is, again, uh, the diversity of projects, even within, well, this already quite diverse CCUS. So we have a very uh, different applications for capture of CO2 from various sources. So biogenic uh, direct air capture we have. We have a capture on various industrial sectors like refineries, steel and cement chemicals, power generation, paper production. And then afterwards, it is like either for utilization or storage. And in the case of utilization, it is in combination with hydrogen, for example, uh, for production of fuels or chemicals. There is actually um, production also of construction materials. And 
uh, 7% actually of uh, the total applications have this potential for net carbon removals. So really um, very, very good results. And uh, I know that some of those uh, projects will be disappointed because they won't be in the seventh invited to second stage, but we're already starting to prepare to get the second call for large scale projects. And we hope to be publishing this already after the summer. So um, I think this is my last slide, actually. I hope I was, um, yes, thank you very much. I hope I fit in the time required. Maria, thank you very much for these remarks. Most helpful, and we're very grateful to have you here. Um, I, as, as I sort of was mentioning in my remarks, I was thinking that it's 10 billion, but it's, it's, it's true that it's some 450 million isn't it kind of so the number the fund actually is, it's it's grown what's what's the outlook for the fund is it is it and also when we were speaking you mentioned clearly the, the other kind of the flip side of of the rising carbon prices it's, it's also makes projects on its own a little bit more economic so what can you say about the outlook for the fund well yes you're quite right uh, we we calculated this 10 billion actually already for the impact assessment and we have kept really this conservative number but since then i mean that is calculated based on 20 euro a ton of co2 to the at the carbon price and as you know the the price has risen since and we have started selling allowances actually at a higher price and uh, we still haven't updated this publicly everybody of course can, can do their calculations we have for the moment 450 million allowances plus the leftovers from the predecessor program which is which are more than a billion and we will be monetizing gradually. So that is one thing to bear in mind. Uh, the second thing to bear in mind is that, uh, as I mentioned, the EU ETS will be updated. So mm. an option is actually to increase the volume of the innovation fund, but also the modernization fund. So in practice, we will have actually to start uh, soon publishing bigger codes because still the period is to remain 10 years. And uh, it is a challenge, it is a challenge. And actually what would be challenging also is for the proposals, because as I mentioned, there are a really big number of proposals, mm. but most of them have a few more years to get to reaching financial close and starting to, uh, to construct and commission afterwards. So everybody has to speed up <laughs> on both sides. And indeed, if we're kind of, we talk about accelerating CCS here, so you know, speed is of essence here, both for CCS, but obviously for reducing emissions and meeting the targets. And there's quite a number of questions about the fund itself. And, and people want to know what the different uh, components, the different applications in terms of different industries, etc, whether it's going to be made publicly available. And we discussed there's a big number, how are you working your way through to advancing them. Um, if there's anything else that you could suggest with us in terms of how the process is working. And needless to say, we can share these questions with you afterwards too, but any other words about mm -hmm. the fund? Well, um, we cannot do more in public publicly. We cannot reveal more publicly because we are still in the process, actually. Right. So even at the end of March, they, there will be an announcement that 70 projects are invited with very limited information because uh, we need to safeguard the competitive nature of the call. And uh, towards the end of the year, when we actually select uh, the, the lucky projects, uh, the successful mm -hmm. projects, we will make more public announcements on the successful projects. Uh, so um, it, there will be like gradually coming more and more information. Soon we are closing the small scale call. I know not so relevant for CCS, but maybe for utilization, we will be also making some announcements on the results. Thank you very much, Maria. As I said, there are more questions for those of you who want to hear her speak again and with also other uh, officers from, from, I believe, DG Energy, DG Klima and DG Research. There is an, another CCS event immediately afterwards, which is organized by the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS Initiative. And you can find the link to it on the EU Industry um, Week webpage. And I believe we'll be tweeting about it as well. But thank you very much, Maria, and we'll speak soon. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'll be discussing um, industrial decarbonization with uh, Europe-based uh, industry experts. Joining us here today are um, Valberg Lundegaard, CEO of Acker Carbon Capture. Hi, Valberg. We Hello, have... everyone. Great to have you here. Rob Thank van der Meer, 
Director, EU Affairs of Heidelberg Cement. Hello. Rob. Hi, Rob. Can hear me. Yes. Hi. And we have Stain Santan, Senior Business Advisor with EBN. Hi, Stain. Uh, good afternoon. Hi. So, um, Acker Carbon Capture, the first pure, car pure play carbon capture company that's floated on the stock exchange, Heidelberg Cement, I believe one of the largest, if not the largest buildings material cement company who's very actively looking to implement carbon capture and storage. And of course, Stain EBN, it's a, I believe it's 100% owned by the Dutch government with various interests in CCS projects, particular um, Athos and Porthos come to my mind. So we have a very, I think, good cross-section of, of uh, participation across uh, from the industry in, in Europe. And um, if that's okay, I would just like to start by asking each of you how CCS fits into your organization's um, business and, and decarbonization strategies and whether that has actually evolved or changed over, over the years. And perhaps if I can start with you, Rob. Ah, thank you. Um, CCS as an issue for the cement industry or for Heidelberg cement, I think that came in focus already in 2004, 2005, when in Norway, the Norwegian government was asking Heidelberg cement, Norsem, to work on a project on CCS. Um, and first reaction, mm, not yet that positive. At group level, I have to say, Norway is something different, but at group level, we said, well, okay, let's do, but careful, uh, this is not the cheapest solution. Hmm. There is a lot of discussion. Can we do it in cement industry? Many, many, many technical questions. C can it be done in the cement industry? Yes or no? Um, in the meantime, it changed, of course. And now the fundament, one of the fundaments of our carbon roadmap as Heidelberg Cement is uh, carbon capture and storage. That carbon roadmap results finally in a carbon neutral concrete in 2050. Mm -hmm. And part of that is uh, the carbon capture and storage facilities that we will have uh, and that we will need. Also other solutions are part of that. So, in the time there was an involvement from hmm, hesitating at group level, I have to say, uh, less in Norway, but more in, uh, in, in different places in the world, to yes, we absolutely, there is no choice on this, we need it. Hmm. And hmm. perhaps to explain if I have enough time for that, uh, to run. Please. Uh, the Please. One of the reasons that we really need carbon capture and storage is that 60% of the emissions coming from cement industry, and that is for Heidelberg cement not different, is coming from process of emissions. That is really related to the raw material, limestone. If you produce cement, if you need cement, you have to start with limestone. And that limestone delivers that 60% of CO2 emissions. And there is simply not that much possible to reduce that. So either you do an end of pipe technology, which is carbon capture and storage, or yeah, no cement. And the market on global level, let's also be honest, uh, we are discussing in Europe on about, say, 140, 180 million tons of cement. The global cement demand is more than 4 billion tons a year. So we are small players in this business. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. Stay, if I could ask you the similar, the same question. Yes, um, EBN is uh, quite a, a different uh, company. It's uh, fully owned uh, by the Dutch state and in fact uh, an investment company which has uh, on average an equity stake of 40% in all the onshore and offshore uh, gas production operators. That has been the tradition and, and that was its, its role um, being a co-investor for oil and gas companies um, wanting to explore and produce in the Dutch continental shelf. And in 2017, um, a change has been made, which has led to, yeah, you could say a transformation, whereby also the strategy was to deploy all the competences to mainly the, the subsurface competences and the competences in managing the joint ventures to apply them for, um, uh, CO2 storage. So um, 
use our role as partner of the EP operators to prepare plans for a second life of the, of the assets. So it's a strategic change also together with uh, the development of geoenergy, which requires the same uh, subsurface expertise and competences. And so basically there are three pillars uh, why we do this strategic change. So one is to extend uh, the life and create a second life for the offshore infrastructure. So platforms, pipelines, what have you to uh, reduce the abandonment cost and the reservation which you need to take uh, to, to remove all the infrastructure, but also to uh, create synergies by having more facilities, uh, let's say CO2 injection, gas production, uh, focused on, on uh, one platform. Uh, so that is a, a, you could say, a financial perspective. Um, and uh, then there are two other objectives which are uh, have a slightly different angle. That is to contribute to both the Dutch and the European objectives of CO2 reduction by deploying uh, CCS and then uh, more specifically the Dutch climate agreement to uh, which is the CO2 reduction objective for 2030, for which a large part is allocated uh, for CCS. And a large part of the, uh, of the companies, the, the Netherlands is a small country, but there is a lot of energy intensive industry and there's a lot of storage potential. And so these industries often also have their, their corporate objectives, uh, which is not only limited to the Netherlands, but much wider. Uh, so we see a role for not just uh, one source to one sink projects, but also up and cluster projects whereby you need a, a, ideally a common shared infrastructure to tie in several CO2 emitters to several storage locations. And those CO2 emitters could well be um, outside the Netherlands. Yeah? So there is more than uh, uh, more storage capacity in the Netherlands than we can uh, actually use ourselves in the Netherlands. And, and that gives the European dimension to this uh, Dutch activity, the connectivity with the other countries. Thank you, Stein. So we've heard sort of drivers from Heidelberg and from EBN in terms of why they are interested in and deploying CCS. Um, Valborg, can I turn to you and, and Acker Carbon coming to the table with a solution or solutions. <laughs> um, Rob uh, presented Heidelberg yeah, Cement as a small player. Uh, for us uh, in Aqua Carbon Capture, they're our most important customer. And uh, together uh, we're uh, uh, implementing the first uh, carbon capture uh, uh, plant on a cement facility in the world, which I'm extremely humble and grateful for. So. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that cooperation, uh, Rob, and we, we will show the world. Uh, but uh, yes, today uh, we are a pure play company, uh, but uh, we're quite uh, new. We're um, in many ways, uh, we have the agility of a startup. However, we also have the strength uh, from the bigger Arker Group. And uh, we are working together with our sister companies in the Arker Group to ensure the delivery of ma major projects. And then I really have to take you into uh, the strategy of the Arco Group, which is uh, actually uh, a story that goes 180 years back in time. And there has been many changes and uh, adaption to uh, changes in the market, new technology uh, and so on. And uh, Arco has been able to survive. But I would say that one of the biggest changes that, and commitments and change in direction that has been made throughout these 180 years is the decision uh, that was made last summer, that we will enter into renewables and low carbon technology mm -hmm. projects. And that was when uh, Arco Carbon Capture was established um, uh, as a pure play company. However, our technology is not new. And uh, we've already talked about uh, a storage project and uh, our technology goes back 20 years in time. When the first uh, storage project uh, uh, in uh, Norway was implemented for the Sleipner field. And uh, Arker delivered the platform for the Sleipner mm -hmm. field. And then we started continuing developing technology for, for carbon capture as well. So uh, I would say uh, we're a small startup, 
Uh, we are growing, definitely growing. We see the market uh, being huge. And, uh, and then we work with partners, both inside uh, the Aqua Group and uh, external partner uh, to meet the expectations there. Our um, key uh, differentiator in the market uh, is not only superior heat integration, which was very important for the cement plant, uh, but also excellent uh, CO2 absorption, but unique HSC characteristics. And I think that is really where we differentiate from our customers. We were heavily challenged uh, on HSC and mm -hmm. uh, emissions, uh, hazardous emissions from the plant when we delivered the technology amongst the plant in 2012. And, uh, and that is why we have focused so much. And I think this is where we go to the market with. Thanks very much, Malbrook. And, and thank you for also underlining the fact that, of course, Norway has been doing CCS since the 1990s, sort of, I think 1996. So it's been, it's been done for a long time safely and, and, and securely in Norway. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it just paves the way for other, um, other sort of developments to come. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a number of other questions about um, public acceptance and one, for example, particularly sort of uh, particular post to stay in about, you know, Netherlands, public acceptance, Groningen. Um, so, uh, but I know that it's, it's a concern for a lot of people. So perhaps if I could uh, start with you, Stain, and, and maybe Walburg and Rob would also like to talk about how, you know, what can the industry do to increase public awareness and, and comfort and support for CCS? So if I could maybe start with you, Stain. And you, Stain, if you could unmute, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, of course, uh, that is crucial for any type of solution, any kind of technology, uh, the, the public awareness and, and public acceptance. And um, what we have seen uh, over, the, over the world is that um, that awareness within both industry and governments have, have grown and uh, methodologies have been developed to, to gain that public acceptance. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think, uh, yeah, also your institute, huh? the Global CCS Institute, has been very instrumental in, in spreading that knowledge, disseminating the knowledge from all the individual CCS projects around the world to create a, a shared learning. And um, I think that uh, the, the, the projects which have become operational or which have been developed till a uh, very far stage uh, like the, the, the Quest project in, uh, in Canada and the Peter mm -hmm. Health project in, in the UK. It, it didn't mature to the operational stage, but um, there was general agreement that the, the whole stakeholder management analysis and development has been done in a very good way. So um, it is, in fact, the basics are very simple. Huh? Um, the, the people live in an environment where you want to build the facilities, where you want to develop the project, want to know what you're doing and want to know what it benefits to them. And if you involve them early on and you use all the best practices and, and learnings which have been uh, accumulated in other projects, then you've got a, uh, a large chance of, of success. So, uh, but it, there are different levels. So you've got the level of the, the local environment, but you've got also the level of um, yeah, I would say it's more ideological, whether you, mm. that CCS is an essential solution to uh, climate change and mitigation, CO2 reduction, etc. And then it's not uh, restricted to the geographical proximity of the project, but it can go national, can go globally, etc. And I think in that sense, there is a role also in, uh, in, in Europe to make clear that in order to reach the decarbonization targets, uh, both on the shorter term 2030 till 2050, that you need um, CCS to realize those, those targets. And um, I think that uh, the, the language which we often use, um, by which we talk about uh, uh, green, renewable, circular, digitization, indeed, these are all important elements. Um, but if you focus on what really counts, the CO2 emission reduction, the number of tons and the cost per ton, then it becomes clear what all those measures contribute. And um, I think there is, is a role for, uh, for both industry and policymakers to, uh, to explain, uh, to, to spread that message. 
And I think um, what you also see um, is that in all, all those CCS projects that have been matured, that besides the technical and financial issues and the permitting issues, the political leadership is also very important. Uh, so um, as, a, as a governor or a minister, it's not sufficient to say, are the permits in order, but you also need to stand up and speak out and say, um, this is vital for us. Um, I fully support this and um, I will do everything within my power to make this successful. And that has been done in, in Norway huh, with, with the, the Prime Minister of Norway. It has been done with Gorgon in Australia. Uh, it has also been done in, in Canada. And I think we also need this to do this in other countries in Europe. Um, it's not just an instrumental exercise. Uh, political support is, is crucial. And that will also have positive impact on the attitude of, of many other people uh, in society on CCS. Thank you, completely agree. And we were delighted actually to have Minister Tina Bru from Norway give us the keynote uh, remarks when we launched our status report on December 1st, so clearly, and, and we're having more support from governments across Europe, but it's a key element. Balborg, Rob, would you like to add anything? Uh, what I would uh, like to add is, is oh, sorry, Balborg, you first. <laughs> okay, what I would like to uh, make clear in this discussion is that CCS is one of the solutions that we need for the society and for, in my specific case, uh, cement industry. We have, in fact, four levers for reduction of emissions that are the traditional ones, change from fuels, uh, clinker substitution. There are new products, obvious, low carbon products, that should be a clear focus. But also the low carbon product will be based on limestone based cements. Mm. So still we have these process emissions. We are looking at new, um, a carbon capture and storage as an option. Carbon capture and use is an option. Mm. And we have the issue of when you look at concrete, concrete is absorbing CO2 from a natural behavior. Now, these four are important in this discussion on a roadmap for the cement industry, and I think for all industrial sectors, you will have the same roadmap. Meaning CCS is one of the solutions. It is an essential solution because without it, it will not be possible for us to decarbonize, but it's one of the roads, roads that we have to go. And now on how does that mean that industry should be part of the acceptance route to CCS? Mm -hmm. Finally, we all have to go into that carbon neutral society and accepting the new types of, yeah, I'll say it, products, uh, behavior, services mm. that will be carbon neutral, hopefully at the end. And for that, we have to all to make choices. And the choices is not to go for a product that simply doesn't exist anymore. But if people want to live in houses, I guess that they will have at the end concrete. Now, if they want to have mobility, you will have type of cars. If they are fueled mm. by carbon-based fuels or by electricity, doesn't change anything. You need something to do that. Now, and that perspective means that for me, industry is to play a role in that acceptance road, but it's also the political uh, uh, point that has to come into it to make it feasible, but it's also about things like the customers that makes, mm. would make, would, must make it possible. They should buy at the end low carbon products or decarbonized products, however you call them. If they don't want to, yeah, hmm, then we are in 2050 coming to the conclusion that we have done something wrong. And that can't be. Thank you. Albert, I hope you have another few points. <laughs> I'll add on to that. I think it was very well stated. Uh, uh, what I see is an increased awareness uh, that uh, carbon capture, um, utilization of storage is part of the solution uh, to fight climate change together uh, with uh, replacing fossil fuel with renewables and energy optimization. And uh, I think this uh, acknowledgement now uh, is something that I experience from all age group, but I, it's driven very much uh, by youth. And I think many of us have experienced now an increased respect uh, from our children because we are doing something about it. And uh, let's 
take that energy that that gives us uh, to drive uh, this um, uh, this initiative. What what I also find is that um, quite a lot of people really don't understand what carbon capture and storage is all about. It's so much easier to understand wind power because there has been windmills all over Europe for hundreds of years, and it's much easier message. Uh, to communicate, you know, anything that has something to do with a uh, process technology and chemicals and things like that, you know, is uh, it's a bit more scary. So uh, we are spending a lot of time on explaining how our technology works, uh, how important it is that it's HSC friendly, uh, and really, uh, you know, use a lot of time on that on webinars, we are active on a lot of social media, uh, we work with NGOs, we, we talk to politicians, you know, all over. And I think that's a responsibility that we all have. And, uh, and finally, you know, we have a unique uh, opportunity now with the long shift development in Norway. And together with Heidelberg uh, Cement, we have already discussed the communication strategy. It goes from everything, you know, to the local community around the cement plant in Bjevik, uh, you know, to customers all over the world with emissions who want to see how this works and they will come and visit our plant. So, and we can ask them, you know, they can be there physically, but they can also follow us uh, digitally and how the development goes. So we have to take that responsibility to communicate. Thank you very much to all of you um, and, and completely kind of agree. And as I say, nothing succeeds like success. So I, I think that that long ship project kind of starting construction and more projects like Porthos coming online, I think it's going to do a lot to um, demonstrate actually how CCS projects kind of can and are there to help um, us decarbonize and, and help with also kind of, you know, uh, industrial transition as well. Um, we've received a few questions about um, enhanced oil recovery and, and there are a number of attendees who've noted, who actually commented that enhanced oil recovery is used around the world, particularly in the US, there may be opportunities there. And of course, Spain, you mentioned about um, extending sort of oil and gas potential infrastructure, et cetera. So are there, you know, are there facilities that use EOR in, in, in Europe at the moment or are there plans to use CO2, to inject CO2 into depleted oil and gas fields, let's say, to uh, get more oil out of the ground. In other words, is, is, is EOR in the cards from your point of view in Europe? And again, maybe if I could st start with Stain and if anybody else wants to add. Yeah, thank you, Gloren. Um, well, it has all started in the in the US, in the in, in West Texas, the, the Permian Basin. There mm -hmm. EOR has been in development. And since then, it has been spreading all around the world. In several countries, uh, is not yet big in the in, in Europe. I know that in uh, Croatia there is an, uh, an uh, CO two EOR project uh, already operational for several years by the State Oil Company of Croatia, which is now part of the Hungarian Mol Group. Mm. Um, I'm not aware of any other operational CO two EOR projects. Um, but um, I know that in the, in the, the current development in, in the US, you have a subsidy for pure CO2 EOR and CO2 and TCS projects, so which, which ensures that also the CO2 for EOR is after recycling finally stored. Yeah. So you could say CO2 EOR, if it's done properly, uh, it has the same function. It gets CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, it would be the only spin-off that you uh, get more oil out of the oil wells. Um, if you compare that to investments in developing new oil fields, you could say, well, in the transition towards an, uh, a society and an economy which will use less and less fossil fuels and more renewables, then I would say CO2 EUR fits in because it avoids large investments in projects that may not reach their economic lifetime within the um, time frame of the transition. Uh, so, yeah, from, from my perspective, uh, I would welcome CO2 EUR because it would also mean that less subsidy is needed from the state and thus finally the taxpayer to make this all feasible. 
again, if Valborg or Rob want to add, or I can kind of move to the next question. Yeah, I can just, uh, you know, Please. say from our perspective, uh, when we were um, uh, established as a pure play company, we experienced uh, customers from all over the world with the, all sorts of emissions uh, uh, to, wanting to talk to us. And we had to prioritize because we see the market is huge, both geographically and in so many various segments. Uh, so what we have prioritized for now uh, is hard to abate sectors uh, like cement, Rob explained mm -hmm. very well, it comes out of the process itself. And we will have this unique position through the Bevic project. Um, we also look at uh, waste um, to energy, bioenergy plants, where you will have negative emissions. Um, blue hydrogen, um, uh, adding carbon capture uh, for existing hydrogen production from natural gas. And, uh, and finally, there are plant uh, gas to power plants. Uh, and then, you know, that should not be developed without carbon capture and storage, the way I see it. Completely agree. And there was actually one specific question given because you were talking exactly about your, your prioritizations. Um, mm -hmm. Does carbon capture, do you intend to, to, are you, or are you intending to do direct air capture as well? Uh, well, uh, we are watching the market, uh, I would say. Uh, I am quite confident that we will see great technology developments in the years to come because this is so important and there are so many good uh, scientists, um, both in uh, universities, research institutes and in company like ours. We have a very strong technology team and we, we will continue to invest in technology development. Um, uh, yes, I, I would not exclude everything, uh, mm -hmm. but we have to get the cost down. And right now, uh, it's uh, it's too expensive. So we need a breakthrough uh, there, that's for sure. And um, thank you for that. And, and the US angle kind of, and actually somebody said both US and Canada, and of course, kind of they lead this scoreboard in terms of CCS facilities and operation and, and also under development, which probably brings me to my next question, which is about the EU industrial strategy, how is it supporting kind of, you know, um, CCS climate action? And, and, you know, the question from the, the audience was, you know, what are the lessons that can be learned from North America, but I'll ask, you know, are there policy actions in the EU that you think can enhance the deployment of CCS? And perhaps if I can now start with Rob on that one. Um, yeah, I, I, I can start on that. Um, so for me, the fundamental, when, when you look at the decarbonization of industry, because we are stepping a little bit out of this only CCS focus, a little mm. bit broader uh, thing, I see, in fact, three pillars for the decarbonization house. Uh, I'm from concrete industries, men industry, so house. I see three concrete pillars for decarbonization of the industry. The first one is a technical development. And for that, we have our clean carbon, uh, our capture uh, here, but we have many others. So the technology will be developed. We have some big challenges on the road to that, not only for cement, also for steel, also for chemicals, but the technology is, I think that we will have that technology in 2050. Mm. The second element is for having a decarbonized industrial world in Europe, you need infrastructure. You need a CO2 infrastructure, but you also need a hydrogen infrastructure, not mentioned yet. We need a renewable electricity structure. We need an infrastructure for waste materials, for circular economy, for using new materials or old materials, reused materials in industry. All that has to be implemented. That is already, can't wait till at somewhere. We have to start now on that. Because the capture and the storage, but also the use of CO2 and also the changed products will have to come into the market as soon as possible. And the third pillar for me, so after the technical, after the infrastructure, the third pillar is the political and I would call societal framework. How do we allow industry to become carbon neutral? Uh, yesterday there was an, uh, an webinar from uh, ZB and there Carl van der Horst van Tata still said, it should be bankable. Now, I'm not sure that I like the word bankable, but what the case is for industry for and other players to have a decarbonation roadmap. Mm. And 
is for that long term not a change you just every half year. Because look at current today, the benchmark for cement starting first of January 2021 is not yet fixed. Mm. So we have a lot of issues on that from a society political framework. And if we are able to arrange that three pillars together in that industrial strategy, I think that we can manage. And I hope that we can do. And I'm, I, I, I think that industry, but not only the industry, we all have to work on that, but we also have the possibilities to do that. So back to the question, what should the industry uh, strategy have? And now back to the concrete uh, question on CCS. One of the essential parts of decarbonation of the industry is that we will have CCS, including the infrastructure for that, including the business case for that. That should the industrial strategy have as one of the elements in the paper. Thanks. Thank you. And I saw Valborg was smiling when you went through infrastructure and business case. So I kind of, I know that, I mean, it resonates with us, but also Valborg, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, well, for me, oh, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, well, uh, this is something we have to work together, uh, you know, EU and the industry. We can only be successful uh, together. And um, first, we, we have to set clear ambitions. Uh, we've heard uh, the targets set by EU, which uh, is great. And I know such a number of uh, industry players that also have set a very ambitious target. So how do we meet them? And uh, on one side, uh, you have... Uh, uh, the financial part, uh, the government funding, the cost of carbon emissions, uh, which is a bit of outside the industry's control. And here, uh, I think it's very important uh, that EU gives predictable uh, regulations taxation and uh, give the industry an incentive to reduce emissions. And um, we already talked about it several times. It's so important to accelerate this market. So there must be a willingness to fund these projects in the early phase so that we can get started. Uh, our part uh, of this occasion is to reduce the cost of carbon capture. And uh, we are doing that uh, continuously. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's a true standardization, efficient delivery models, and so on. We have a medium-sized uh, plant, which a uh, standardized plant, which is much uh, smaller than the one we are delivering to Heidelberg Cement. Here we have been able to standardize and we've actually reduced the cost since 2012 with 90%. So it's possible. We will do the same as we've seen in wind and solar. And of course, we have to work together uh, on those big scale projects and standardize uh, and reduce as well. So that's important. So, my biggest concern in this is that there is not sufficient incentives uh, for industries um, to invest in carbon capture and storage uh, in those early years. You need to really promote those early movers so that they can take that brave decision and, and implement uh, CCS. And then you have the fast followers, and there are a number of them. We saw that from uh, uh, Maria's presentation earlier about the um, applications for the EU Innovation Fund. But then you'll have the big crowd uh, approaching 2030 and they see that they will not be able to meet their ambitious target because they are too late. Uh, so that we just need to get started. We need the sense of urgency. And I think uh, we as an industry will do all we can to reduce the cost, but we need EU to be willing really to move fast. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Um, Stan, any further thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with uh, with Valborg. It's it's absolutely essential to get cost reduction in CO two capture, and it's only interesting for companies to fully um, spend a lot of effort and 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 capital on developing technologies when you know there will be a large market, and uh, there is a role for for governments and the EU to promote uh, the early movers. I still recall when I was at an investment conference in 2008 about CO2 capture and there were a lot of different <laughs> startups and technologies, but if there is no market, you, you won't get far. So that's the role of the EU creating the market for the technology. That's on the technology side. I think uh, 
policy-wise, there are a few things which uh, should be uh, in place, uh, especially on a European level. Uh, that is to uh, to get a, a what they call uh, the carbon tax cross-border adjustment, so that mm. uh, carbon-intensive products which are imported uh, get a tax so that they can compete on a fair basis with low carbon tax products made in the in the EU and that could be fertilizers that could be cement that could be steel that could be anything which is energy and, and thus currently CO2 intensive then the second part is the the shipping because we noticed that there are countries with a lot of energy intensive industries but not necessarily do these countries have the CO2 storage available so we need transport mechanisms between the areas where there's a lot of storage potential, like in, in the Netherlands, we have uh, mm. 1700 million tons CO2 storage capacity. That is incredibly large amount. And uh, you would like uh, to facilitate the, the transport from other areas outside the Netherlands to, to those uh, storage areas. And that could be either by pipeline or by, by shipping but uh, you, you need to have the regulation in place. And it's from one thing that's the CO2 accounting for CO2 shipping, yeah, mm -hmm. which has been uh, awarded by DG Klima to Norway, but which has not yet been fully communicated on a European level. And that would be nice to, to have that done. Uh, but it's also to promote uh, the um, a large shared infrastructure where you have the catch 22 dilemma that you only invest in a large yeah. infrastructure, if you know you will have customers uh, and the customers will only invest uh, if they know that there will be a CO2 transport infrastructure. Well, that's typically an area where the EU can step in to give guarantees and to give the certainties to project developers and investors that the development will really take place. So it's, it's on the technology side, it's on the infrastructure side. And then also, uh, in the past, uh, CCS was fully seen uh, for fossil fuel-based power production, be it coal and, and gas. Then it shifted over to industry. And now we see that to reach the, the final goals, we also need to have solutions for um, biogenic emissions. So either derived from, from biomass installations or from waste. And I see a big potential in uh, regulation uh, for negative emissions, uh, allocating um, value to emissions which are biogenic origin. We have currently 100 million tons waste per year in Europe, uh, which is already uh, this recycled part is already subtracted. So there's a lot of potential to use that waste for energy production or hydrogen production. Uh, but then you need an incentive to store it. So I think we, we have to focus more on the, the hard to abate sectors because there is very little internal alternatives for uh, biomass units and, and waste units to ICCS. So on, on these three, three areas, I think um, uh, there's a big progress which can be made. It's fantastic that we already have the European Emission Trading System. We have the Innovation Fund. So a lot of things are, are in place, but if we get on those areas, which I just mentioned, uh, regulation in place, that would really kickstart uh, all, the, all the, 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 the innovation which is needed to get this on, on large scale. Thank you. Um, and you know, this has been a fantastic and really fascinating discussion. I've got more questions that I kind of wanted to ask you, but also kind of more questions coming through, but we've come up to the hour. So I would like to thank you very much um, for joining us today and to our audience if you missed any part of the discussion or if you'd like to recommend it to your colleagues it will be available on our website at globalccsinstitute.com in the coming days and if you follow us um, on, at, on twitter uh, we will alert you once the recording is public thank you very much for joining us today and i hope you all have a great day thank you